Uh, my name is Rokroshka. Thanks very much for having me. Um, I run the development of the Renko platform at the Swiss Data Science Center, and I'm uh, based at the ETH Zurich. Uh, we have a second office in Lausanne where half of our team works. Um, so I'll give you an introduction to uh, Renko and what we're trying to do with this platform. A lot of what I'll talk about is not actually what you'll be using in the course, but given that um, you're all scientists. I'm hoping that you'll find it uh, interesting anyway. Uh, so, and I'm hoping to uh, recruit some of you to be uh, a, a long-term rank users. So let's let, let's see how that goes. So, um, to just to, to just to motivate uh, where we're coming from here. So, some some time ago, I received an email like this. Uh, I used to do research in astrophysics, um, and I got an email about a paper that I wrote about 10 years ago from a, a grad student that was trying to reproduce a plot from one of my papers. And um, she was basically looking at the code that I'd made publicly available on, uh, on Bitbucket, um, and which I thought was enough to make my work uh, reproducible by others. <laughs> so she was looking at my code, trying to decipher what was happening there and trying to repeat one of my plots. And of course, um, couldn't get anywhere because Nothing was uh, very well documented. I didn't have any sample data and so on. So and I, I was very embarrassed because uh, as a lead of a team just trying to develop a platform on, for reproducibility, um, this was kind of an embarrassing email to have to <laughs> receive um, and not have a proper response for. Um, so Brink was primarily about enabling uh, what, we, what we're referring to as practical reproducibility. And I'll, Tell you in a second what, what I mean by practical, um, but basically, I think we, you've probably all heard about uh, this term, the reproducibility crisis in science, and it comes from various sources. But the upside is that because people are sort of acutely aware of this issue now, um, there is recently what uh, has been termed the credibility revolution, meaning that there's a lot of people working on. Um, making reproducibility easier, making it more accessible, making people more aware of the problems. And so there's a lot of sort of uh, uh, high level reasons why you may care about reproducibility, but the main reason why you should care is that somebody is probably eventually going to ask you uh, how to reproduce something from a paper you've written, and this can turn out to be not so nice, even if you have the best intentions. So here's uh, some snippets from, the, from this code that the student was referring to. Um, it's all sort of nicely organized, um, but you can see that there's very little, uh, very little comment, very little description of what any, anything here means. And I won't get into the details here, but basically um, we can have a look at what's missing. So um, the code is versioned and well-structured, which is great. Um, it's, um, it's, but it's not telling you what kind of data you need to run this code. So uh, somebody trying to reproduce or reuse this code has no idea um, what sort of data they should feed through it. Um, there's no information about the runtime environment. So I have a bunch of libraries in here, but this is from 10 years ago. So you might imagine that these, uh, these versions are all very different. And there's no indication what those versions were. So presumably if you try to run this code now, there might be some hiccups. And most importantly, there's no indication of how code and data should be combined to produce the results. So there's no, there's no uh, sort of workflow description. So the takeaway from this I just wanted to, to have is that um, data and code or sharing data and sharing code is not enough. You have to um, have a very clear description, a very clear indication of how those two link together to actually reproduce results. And what we're trying to get away from in the end is to, um, to not have our, our uh, disciplines look like this, right? That we're basically just stirring pots of, uh, of black boxes and coming up with some, some result that we don't really understand. Uh, we want to make sure that it's clear that there's a head and a tail to what we're doing and that um, especially in domains of, of machine learning, et cetera, that there's some hope for, uh, for understanding what's happening under the hood. So um, with Renko, we're motivated by these 
five sort of simple questions in, in, in data-driven research. So first of all, um, we want to be our best future collaborators. So we want to ask the question um, how I computed the results, right? So are we going to be able to answer the question how I computed the results? Because a few months from now, I may not remember exactly what parameters I used, what functions I, I ran, and so on. So just for, for, for uh, myself, for yourself, how, how something took place. Then if that's under control, you want to understand how new data might change this result, and you want to be able to apply this new data um, to, see, to see how the downstream uh, changes um, are reflected. And you may probably work with other people, so you want to know how they computed their results, and you want to know if you can use their data to reproduce it, if you, if you can even use their code, or in many cases, you actually want to also run it on their uh, infrastructure, because either the data um, is big or the computational complexity is high, so you need to, to use some special infrastructure. Um, <laughs> this got cut off. Um, that's the beauty of not having the presentation mode. I can just edit the slides on the fly. <laughs> um, you, if you're working in a more uh, theoretical uh, capacity, you may want to know. You may want. You may be interested in algorithms. They may want to know if a particular algorithm has been applied to a particular set of data and how, and you want to know whether this worked or, or what people have to do to make it work. And finally, I think for all academics, it's extremely important to have um, attribution in the end for the work that you're doing. And so um, you want to know if, if you're working in, in a capacity where you're following sort of open science principles and putting your data out there, publishing it on Zenodo and putting your algorithms out there, making them available for people. Um, you, in the end, want to know where these research artifacts of yours are going. You want to know if people are, what context people are using them in. And ideally, you want to be able to um, point this out to whoever is interested, presumably a funding agency, um, and say, look, I've, I've shared my data and it's resulted in, in 50 publications uh, by people who I've never actually talked to, but they, they seem to be finding it interesting. And this is a, clearly a valuable product of my research. Um, and typically, actually, in, in, in the current mode of, of sharing on, on various platforms, um, this is the, probably almost the hardest one because uh, there's this one-way uh, link between the producer of something and the consumer of, of something, of, of a code or data. So if I publish data on the node or if I publish code on GitHub, um, I never know who ends up using this data or code. The people that are using it know where it comes from, obviously, because they have a link to my repository, but, um, but, they, but I never know where it goes until they tell me. So these five questions boil down to just a few words for us, and this is sort of... Uh, the driving principles behind what we're trying to develop with Renku, and that's to focus on the ideas of reproducibility, on uh, the re reusability of, the, of research artifacts, and on um, collaboration. Um, so, so what is Renku really? It kind of wears it wears many hats. It's uh, it's it's at the same time a, a complex piece of machinery and and but we're trying to make it as easy as possible so we're trying to integrate existing technologies to make to make answers to these questions uh, more more approachable so we are first of all everything is based on git so you'll and you'll see this very quickly that every project in renku is actually a git repository so everything is versioned um, your code your data and uh, if you end up using workflows, which you won't be doing in this course, but uh, those are, but if you end up doing that in the future, those are also uh, versions. We use um, existing tooling for providing interactive sessions, so everything is based on uh, Jupyter, and we provide optionally um, our studio 
in, in our uh, Docker images, which I think you'll be using in this course. Um, everything is based on con containers so that uh, you can more or less easily hand your runtime environment to someone and they can uh, go from there and actually um, have everything they need already included uh, in, in there to, to, to either repeat what you did or build on what you did. And we also build on this idea of analysis workflows, which uh, people working in, in bioinformatics are very, very familiar with. Um, but rather than um, requiring people to write workflows, we actually try to create workflows for them on the fly as they work. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that uh, in a minute. And the defining feature of Renku is that all of this information, uh, the, we, we try to capture a lot of metadata about what people are doing uh, and, and record it all uh, in a knowledge graph, which to first order allows you to replay your analysis to see how you arrived at a particular result. But um, in the end, what the intention is, is that this should serve as the primary way of, of searching and discovering uh, data and workflows and people in the end as well um, on, the, on the platform. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the concept of the knowledge graph in a second. Um, but you should, but before we go to that, I just wanted to point out that one of the confusing <laughs> aspects of Renku sometimes is that there's basically kind of two modes in which people work with Renku. One is Renku Lab, which is this online in browser uh, web application where you have project management, you have, um, you can uh, share your, your code and notebooks and so on. Uh, you can collaborate with people. Uh, you have uh, interactive sessions, and you can also actually, recently we pushed a change that allows you to, that allows uh, anybody to, to actually spawn uh, interactive sessions from public projects. So if you have a project that is open to the public on Renku Lab, it works a, a little bit like MyBinder, if, you, if you're familiar with that, where you can just uh, hand somebody a link and they can come in there, click a button, and they, they can spin up your, your notebook sessions. Uh, of course, they can't they can modify your project at all, but they can run what you have there. Um, and the second aspect of Renku is this command line interface. And this is what, what uh, drives the, some of the knowledge graph uh, and some of the metadata capture. And the nice thing about this is that it can run anywhere, so it doesn't actually need any server-side component. It only requires a recent version of Python and you need to install a library. Um, this is what you can use it to manage data and automatically capture provenance of, of things that you work on. Um, and it doesn't need any, any hosted piece for just using it within a single project. So you can uh, just run it on your laptop. You don't need to... Uh, Push, push your code anywhere if you don't want to, uh, but you can still use all of the reproducibility features uh, for single projects. And as, as soon as you send your data to the server, then we can start to establish cross-project links based on what data you're using if you're sharing data sets. Um, for example, this then becomes clear uh, in, the, in the online platform. And if you're interested in, I think this is, you, you probably will not be using any of the Renko CLI in the, in the course, uh, but if later on you're interested, we have a tutorial that walks you through some of the functionality and I encourage you to look at that. Um, but what I wanted to, the point I want to drive home here as well is that in both of these sort of modes, uh, the, every, every project is still Git repository. So even in the online, uh, in, the, in the web app, um, there is a fully fledged GitLab server behind each project where you can uh, eventually, if you need to do something more complex, complex, you can go there and use that functionality as well. So I wanna walk you quickly through this idea of a knowledge graph and why we think this is, uh, this is important to, to maintain. So I'm gonna walk you through a scenario of two projects working in the same domain with different tools and a third project that sort of comes 
comes into it from a different perspective. Um, and if you don't know what a knowledge graph is, um, I'm about to explain, so <laughs> don't worry. Um, so in a, in a knowledge graph, basically, uh, it, all, all this term means is that you have, you have, uh, you, 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 you express facts about, about every, every entity uh, that you care about. So in knowledge graph, we would have a project and this project would have, um, let's say a data set inside. And we would have in knowledge graph, we would have this edge that would have some uh, particular type of name. In this case, we would say that the project has a part that is a data set and this data set has a part that is a file. And in a real knowledge graph, all of these would have additional uh, additional edges here, additional uh, properties attached to them. So a project would have a type and it would have a creator and it would have a date and it would have um, all kinds of, of various metadata attached to it. I just didn't include them here because it would be too cluttered, but that's essentially what a knowledge graph looks like. Um, and when we, when we, run uh when we execute some code in renku with the command line interface um we uh, automatically record additional additional things here so if i now this researcher runs uh, some sort of code uh in the platform we we say that then this file was used by a particular code and had a particular output and this is now some pre-processed data down here so already this researcher has recorded a pipeline. Um, this is the pipeline and there's some additional metadata here about what, what this pipeline consists of, so namely that there's a, a data set inside with some DOI attached to it and it has some data. Now a second researcher comes in and they're interested in the same data set. So they import the same data set. This project has the same uh, data set in it. And the researcher looks at the knowledge graph and realizes that there is already uh, some use of this data um, in the platform. So they have a look at what this other person has done and they see that they've, they've established this pre-processing pipeline uh, for this data that they're interested in. And so instead of having to repeat the pre-processing pipeline, they just uh, use this data and they have the full knowledge of how this data was pre-processed because it's all recorded. And so if they don't like something in the pre-processing pipeline, they can modify it and rerun it themselves if they want to, or they can just use this data as is. And also if the, if the original author of, of this pre-processing pipeline changes something here, um, the consumer of this, of this data can, can see this and update and update their, um, their results or their, their, um, their input data here. But they're not interested in just stopping and pre-processing. They actually want to do something with this. So they, uh, they build some additional pipeline on top where they train some model or what have you, and this produces an output. And so now this researcher, the second researcher has full knowledge of, they basically saved a bunch of time because they didn't have to pre-process this data, but they also have full knowledge of the entire, of the entire chain, um, which they can then uh, modify and rerun as they want. And in addition, the original author of the pre-processed data here, project one, um, they can see that not only do they have this pipeline that they recorded, but they can see that somebody has used their data and they can see how, and they can see exactly what results it led to. So um, if they wanted to see if this pre-processed pre data is useful, they immediately have the answer that um, indeed people in their, in their discipline are uh, using this expensive pre-processed data for for additional for additional science, and because this is a knowledge graph, we can attach arbitrary metadata to these uh, to these uh, to these models to these executions uh, in the in the, the that are being done. And actually, we have a, an extension now that we're building for machine learning specifically where not only do you have this abstract notion of this is an output, this is a, this is a code that ran, et cetera, but you have additional information like this is a particular type of model, this had a particular uh, runtime, 
this had a particular um, a particular type that it was type of model that was working with, and so this allows then for somebody from an entirely different domain. Say this is a a person working on machine learning uh, specifically. They come in and they say, well, let me see what people are doing with this type of model in in the platform, and they discover actually this whole branch of of or this whole uh, field that is relying on these types of models for their um, for the results and they realize now that this the, the models that they're working on that they you know <laughs> care about deeply uh, have a much wider audience they have a much wider application uh, so this connects them to this whole field that they may not have known about before so this is kind of an idea of of why why we're bothering with uh, with with a concept like a knowledge graph in a platform like Renku, where we hope that there's going to be really potential for some of these bi-directional uh, links to take place. And so once we have the knowledge graph, it becomes easy to answer these questions that, that I described at the beginning. So it's easy to see who is using the data and how. It's, you can see which algorithms are used to, to do what. Um, you can replay pipelines to regenerate results. Uh, to respond to new data um, or you can also um, notify someone if data that was previously there is no longer available um, you can know who to credit if you're using a particular type of data or a particular type of algorithm um, and you can see how data sets can be transformed and used which makes makes them infinitely more usable because uh, in you know, data repositories are great, but if you just have data in a data repository with a readme file, most of the time it's still going to be very difficult for anybody to use. Um, so data sets with attached data with an actual pipeline attached to them, which shows you how you can use them are, are much, much more useful. Um, so our hope is that we can convince scientists that these that if you follow these best practices at a practical level, so at a, at a level where they're actually, uh, where these reproducibility concepts and ideas are actually useful in the day-to-day -day, that they make you more productive, um, scientists will actually be more productive because they'll spend less time remembering how to do something, less time sort of uh, thinking about how to, you know, organize their deeply nested directory structures or whatever. Um, and instead, rely a bit more on 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 these on these concepts like like the knowledge graph. Um, we we hope that the that by doing this, that there will be better visibility for for projects and results, and better impact either within the organization or within uh, a lab or within a community. And it also, um, if you share this publicly, it's also um, uh, it also helps to boost um, trust because you are you are saying, you know, uh, you're kind of laying it all out for everybody to see, right? You're not just hiding behind uh, the abstractions in the paper. You're basically making it available for anybody to, to scrutinize. So how is Renko used today? Um, you know, uh, we're not at this full picture yet, and um, uh, we're working. We're working on realizing this this vision. Renko is still a relatively young project, but we have a, a very good team in place, and we hope this year to actually make big strides in, in making this this vision more of a reality. But today, uh, Renko is already being used um, by in in various in various ways by various people. So we do have some um, individual researchers, like I said at the beginning, just tracking the progress of the of their work and communicating results to their peers. They're not really um, using a lot of the interactive session uh, functionality and so on, but they're using the actually the command line interface to track their their work and making their their work more reproducible. Um, we have lots of groups that work with the Swiss Data Science Center. And our data scientists are using Renku to collaborate with them on a project. And there, the use of live environments is, is very much the core aspect because the data scientists will create some 
um, they'll come up with some result and then they'll they'll create a, a Jupyter notebook that, that illustrates this result and share that with the PI and the PI can go in and actually rerun everything uh, in any way they they want and 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 look at the look at the um, look at what's been done and actually get their hands hands a bit dirty. Um, we have quite a few we have a few cases where uh, they are uh, rank is used by people in a more um, sort of data management capacity so people are using it to make it as a public and self-documented so they'll have a data set in there um, with some description with some readme file and then in addition there'll be a notebook or maybe even a pipeline attached to that um, there's also similar to this um, there are some projects that are providing pre-processed data sets that others can then uh, kind of work off of and which is kind of the, exa the example that I described in the in the cartoon knowledge graph uh, discussion a second ago and um, an exciting development which we didn't anticipate from the beginning to be honest um, is that people are teaching courses with with, with Renku um, with all the batteries included, so it's it's uh, it's been used in the way that you'll see that you'll see today, where the instructors set up the environment with, and sometimes these environments can be very complex or take a long time to set up. So uh, a lot of work goes into actually creating the environment, but once it's there, all the students have to do is click a button, and and they're uh, already in. In a session with all the software available and all the data available to them so there's very little overhead in actually just getting the course off the ground so just a quick word of where we're going because as i said renku is still very much a work in progress um, we are constantly recently improving the ease of use of the data set functionality and i think um, this course actually does make use of the um, Data set interface already, so uh, I was happy to see that that's that that's getting used. Um, but we're we're still making that easier to use, in particular, uh, easier to reuse data sets in other projects uh, is is being developed now. Um, if you look at the existing Renku projects now that have some pipelines recorded, you'll notice that the knowledge graph is not very uh, very nice to look at <laughs> for the time being. So we're working on improving the knowledge graph model to make this presentation more useful. And maybe what's interesting for this uh, audience is that we are actually uh, in the process of completely rebuilding how the workflows are being uh, handled so that they, allow, they will allow us to serialize uh, these workflows to various formats. So at the moment we're relying almost exclusively on the common workflow language but our plan is to uh, have to be able to translate not just to CWL, um, but to also other uh, workflow languages. So that if you if you're working in a particular environment or your infrastructure requires that you run with a specific uh, workflow system, you'll be able to take this sort of abstract representation of what happened in a Renko project and uh, put it into a workflow language that you can then run on your infrastructure. Um, this is a really exciting uh, possibility that we're working on right now. Um, and it, it will allow us to run workflows in the cloud. So if you record something, you'll be able to say, okay, now I ran this on my laptop on some small data, and I want to rerun this workflow now on bigger data in the cloud or on my HPC cluster. And you'll be able to do this uh, from from Renko itself, um, but um, also we're very much looking for input on what uh, is interesting for people to have in a platform like Renko. So if you have questions or if you have ideas, um, please reach out to us. We have this open public deployment which you'll be using for for the course. Um, but if you have uh, Sort of general questions about how to do something or you want to you're not finding something you're looking for uh, we have a forum at uh, we have a discourse forum at rankwood.discourse.group so please reach out to us there um, uh, this is really a place where you can ask kind of open-ended questions um, we 
we have all the code publicly available on GitHub, and the main repository is at Swiss Data Science Center slash Renku. And there, if you find something that um, is not just a question, but, uh, but more of a bug report or more of a specific feature request, um, you should go there and, and open an issue with us. And it, once you're done with, uh, with using Renko for a little while, or once you've used Renko for a little while, we would really appreciate uh, if you could um, fill out the survey that we have, just so we have a, we're trying to collect some information about where our audiences are coming from and what their technical backgrounds are and so on. Um, so I'll stop there. I, I think I won't do a demo, which I normally do following this presentation because you'll, you'll get that anyway <laughs> in the class. Um, but I just want to thank you for, for having me. And please, um, if, you, if you find Renko interesting um, for like, sort of beyond the course, uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from, um, from you to, to learn more about what, you, what, what you're doing and what you'd like to do. Um, so don't be shy and, and, and get in touch. And we, yeah, I hope that uh, you'll find it useful. Thanks very much.